It's midwinter here in Scotland and the temperature hasn't been much above freezing for the past few months. Today we're on the hunt for an incredibly special mushroom that can be found all throughout the year. It's got a huge array of uses which has lent it the name the Swiss Army Knife of Fungus. Some of those uses are it can be used as a band-aid for wounds, it can be used to cure intestinal parasites, you can make it into a tea to shake hard to shift viruses and flus and that sort of thing. Um, it's been used as a strop to sharpen your knife and if you even dip it in saltpetre, dry it, you can use it as a fuse to light explosives. That mushroom is the birch polypore, also known as the razor strop fungus. In Latin it's the Pitoporus bitulina, but its name has changed now to Fomatopsis bitulina. So today we're going to show you what the mushroom looks like, how to find it, and we're going to demonstrate some of those uses. Now that we've set up camp here, let's go and find a birch polypore and I'm going to show you the first preparation which is how to make a tea from it. Come on Hempy, you bring a stick. What is it? Come on. We've come across a beautiful wintry birch tree here and you can see one of the trunks here is actually broken and is decaying. That's allowed the birch polypore fungus to actually enter in and take root. Let's reveal some of these polypores now. Make great little shells for the snow. So you can see here, um, the growing season started in August and it ended in November. So this is just a few months growth. Um, they're quite large specimens. They can sometimes grow up to 30 centimeters on the cap. You can see they've got this lovely gradient kind of sunburst brown color on the cap here and underneath a beautiful creamy white uh, porous surface because they are polypores of course. Um, the spore print of these mushrooms is white and um, they will usually last for about a year. When they begin to decay you'll see them become more sort of white and flaky and the undersurface will darken and actually turn black and start to peel off. You can see here a little bit of a close-up of the colour. Where they emerge from the birch tree they form this hump because they actually come out in a pronounced globe, a ball, and then they burst into the polypore. Um, they have sometimes these lovely kind of wavy caps. Some of them can be quite perfect and straight. These specimens have got a little bit of a wave in it. Um, you can see that that brown surface can actually be peeled off to reveal a very white underside. Often remind me of those German biscuits, the, the Lebkuchen. In terms of the, the feel of them, they're very hard, they're quite corky, almost like hard rubber, maybe think of neoprene, that kind of feel. Um, especially now this one's slightly frozen so it's even harder. You can see they're white underneath the lovely brown cap there. Let's have a look at the underside the porous surface. It doesn't particularly mark when you squish it so it's definitely not to be confused with the artist's bracket which would mark as soon as you scratch it. Um, so it drops its spores here which are white and um, this porous surface as I said before will darken with age and begin to peel off actually. This uh, birch polypore is actually parasitic to the birch tree and uh, causes brown rot. 
As with harvesting any mushroom, you want to be quite respectful. So I'm only going to take this nice example here. I'm going to cut it off at the uh, base of the polypore. There we go, first specimen. Pretty good mature specimen there. Not too many black marks on the pore surface, so it's still quite sort of middle-aged and healthy. I think this one actually popped up um, last the end of last year, so it's still quite young. Polypore in the pocket. Let's go and find uh, see if we can find some younger specimens and some older specimens now. Don't confuse the birch polypore with the famous hoof fungus, which also grows on dead birch trees. The mushroom appeared in the last shot was just a really old version of this, which is the Fomus vomentarius, the tinder fungus or the hoof fungus. You can tell it's uh, distinctly different from the birch polypore because of the, the sheer solidity of its cap. I mean, it's almost as hard as the bark on the birch tree that it that it lives on. Um, also, the pore surface is a lot browner, and uh, when it's younger, it's white. When it ages. It turns brown and then eventually black like the one I just showed you. Interestingly, the hoof fungus or the Fomus fomentarius was also carried by Utsu the Iceman. He had four pieces of this, as well as the birch polypore, and they reckon it was this one he was using for um, fire lighting because it has an excellent ability to maintain embers and catch a, an ember and turn it into fire. Just found a few really old birch polypores here on this lichenous birch stump. I think you can see there's actually another fungus growing on the decaying cap there, which has got little brown hairs. Go find the mushrooms, Hempy. Should we find the mushrooms? Oh, where are they? Where are the mushrooms? Sorry, I had to move camp out from under that tree there because all the melting snow is dripping on the camera and dripping on everything, and probably not much good for fire making. So to make our birch polypore tea, I am going to cut this into small strips, and I'm going to slowly boil it for maybe half an hour or something. What you should do at home is cut it into strips, actually dry it in the sun, which apparently increases the vitamin D, and then you're gonna make your um, hot water extraction. So the key with this tea is actually to, to boil it at a very low temperature uh, for a very long time to try and expect, extract as much goodness from the mushroom as you can. To get my fire going, I'm gonna try and make a Finland torch, so chop this bit of wood into four, wham it in the snow, and then it should make quite a nice little pot stand. Wish me luck, because everything's a bit wet. A little bit more insulation. Nice and naturally sprung as well. And then we'll split it again, try and keep it top end as dry as possible. This has been sitting in my cabin for a while, so hopefully it's nice and dry. Okay, and again, that's our top side. Sort it, right. So what we're going to try and do, away from our seat a little bit, is bash these into the ground. So I've got my four pieces of the birch stuck in the ground now, and uh, good enough to rest the, the pot onto. So let's see if we can light this up. get some snow in here, melt it down for our water. I'm afraid I've had to switch to phone camera for a bit because my Big SLR has run out of batteries. So for the time being, I'll continue on the phone. We can see the pot of water has been on for about five minutes now. And it's probably at the heat 
where we want to get the mushrooms in. So let's chop up the polypore. Get them fairly thin so we can get as much goodness out of the mushroom as we can. Birch polypore has been a long-standing folk medicine in the Northern Hemisphere and it's especially popular nowadays even in the Baltic countries, Siberia and Northern Russia. Um, up there it's used for a kind of immuno-enhancing, soothing tonic when it's extracted like this from hot water. It's got some amazing chemicals in it. One of them in particular is damaging to the intestinal parasite whipworm. And there's a great story where in 1991 Utzi the Iceman uh, was found in a glacier in Austria. He was a, a Neolithic man who'd fallen into a glacier and died and had been found in a perfectly preserved state. Now, Utzi was carrying around his neck a leather cord and on it were three pieces of the birch polypore with a hole in the middle tied onto this leather cord. Um, they wondered, uh, the anthropologist and archaeologist wondered why he had that and actually an examination of his uh, lower end of his uh, food system, shall we say, they found that he had eggs of the parasite whipworm. And so it's quite possible that he was carrying this as a medicine to treat the gastrointestinal symptoms that were coming from these whipworm. Quite amazing. So I'm going to try and attempt to cut a replica of those three bits later. This was actually the first mushroom I ever consumed, even before chanterelles or any of the other kind of obvious easy ones. Um, there was one night in the bungalow in winter and I just had this awful flu coming on. Really awful, and I could feel that it was going to last for a few days. Anyway, I somehow remembered, I think it might have been from a Ray Mears episode where he was in Siberia, uh, about the birch polypore tea. So I went out into the forest um, late at night and gathered a polypore. And I probably boiled one about this size, the whole thing, for maybe three hours, very slow and I drank about two litres of the water with uh, no sweetener or anything. And um, I did that before I went to bed and a very bizarre kind of repetitive dream for about eight hours and um, quite uncomfortable, not because of the mushroom, but because of the flu. And when I woke up, I woke up about 8 a.m. and the flu had completely gone. Not only had it disappeared with all the symptoms, but I felt better than I had before I'd even got the flu. In fact, I felt so good. I was on a sort of physical high for about two weeks where I just had so much energy and just felt amazing. Um, and from then on, I started kind of telling everyone about the birch polypore tea and it became sort of quite popular around the village. And it's been a favorite for me every time I've felt a little bit run down, especially at the moment with this global pandemic, I think it's quite important we can do everything um, we can to kind of bolster our immune system. So if it has been shown to have antiviral properties against SARS and MRC, then perhaps it's got properties against the uh, novel coronaviruses. I guess it won't hurt. But of course, remember, if it's the first time trying this, um, just have a little bit to start with and see if you get on. I actually seem to get on with it totally fine. It doesn't give me any diarrhea, stomach upset or anything like that. In fact, it just makes me feel a lot better. As well as being amazing Aboriginal folk remedy in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, it's also been tested around the world recently by scientists in the last 20 years and found that it does indeed have these amazing antimicrobial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antibiotic and antiparasite effects because of the chemical nature of the mushroom. Quite understudied comparatively to some other mushrooms. It's been shown to have real promise in terms of developing various drugs I think I'm nearly there, it's starting to darken a wee bit. If you're familiar with the cartoon animation uh, by Tova Janssen, the Moomins, you might know the character called the Grok. Uh, she's a sort of winter goddess who lurks around the birch forests and if you notice her nose is identical to a birch polypore, which is quite funny. She really wants friends in the story but can never really have any uh, because she freezes everyone that comes near her and everything. 
So she's quite a, a lonely, forlorn character. Now be warned, when you've made this, the taste is incredibly bitter because of the compounds in the polypore. Um, it took me a while to get used to the bitterness, but now I actually quite enjoy it. So I've got a bit of ginger here, which I'm going to add into the concoction. Just get the, let's just shave a little bit of that ginger in there. And I'm also going to add, I've got this lovely Scottish local honey here. So a good bit of that going to go in. There we go. And that's just going to take the edge off the bitterness and also the ginger give it some fire. I mean, honey and ginger have also been used classically as well for kind of winter immune tonics. So let's just give ourselves all the insurance we can against the nasty viruses that may be lurking out there in civilization. So another awesome property of the birch polypore is in wound dressing. See the porous uh, surface on the underneath here. I've actually done little cutaways so you can see. We're going to pull out a section and we can use that as a wound dressing. It's got uh, in the mushroom stipic properties which means that it can prevent bleeding and also with its antiviral and antibacterial and antifungal uh, compounds in the mushroom it's actually a great wound dressing. So let's cut a little bit out and I'll show you what it, what it does. So we're very carefully going to pop out this section of the pores here and kind of run along with our finger and just peel that up, just like that, try and get the whole thing. Okay, so imagine you had a bleeding wound. Um, this could also be a little bit drier if the weather wasn't so wet. And you could actually wrap this round and maybe tie it off with a string. Obviously this is quite a mature polypore, so its porous layer is very thick. But if you caught it earlier in the season, you could get a little bit more of a practical, smaller um, and if it was a bit dry, it'd be slightly more absorbent. But yeah, there you go. And you, you could, you could, if you had some tape, you know, you could tape it around an open wound, and it'd be quite good until you can get medical attention. Um, so yeah, amazing. The tea's been going about 45 minutes now, and um, that'll probably do me for today. If you're doing it at home, maybe in a slow cooker or on the hob, really low, you could probably think about doing it for three or four hours, maybe even all day in a slow cooker. And so you're sure you're extracting all those goodies. I'm a bit concerned now my torch has burned down that I'm scorching this bit of ground here. So I'm going to uh, put the fire out and just get some snow on it, cool everything down. The reason there's not much is because I lost a bit when the torch collapsed. We extra tea bag in there. Mmm, so nice with the kind of sharp bitterness of the birch polypore, the fiery ginger, and the sweet honey. It works so well together. It's also nice if you add a bit of lemon juice, or you could even think about foraging for some kind of high vitamin C berries or fruits that you could find in summer. You could freeze them or dry them and then add them into your birch poly polypore tea as your winter tonic. Oh. Yeah, hopefully it'll keep the novel coronavirus at bay for a few more weeks until we can get out of lockdown, if it ever comes. Cheers. Right, I think time to pack up, head back to the cabin and uh, do some more experiments with the mushroom.
Perhaps the most well-known use of the birch polypore is for honing of metal knife blades. The rubbery and fibrous flesh of the birch polypore makes for an excellent way of honing and polishing the blade once it's been sharpened. So I'll show you how I'm going to do that. I cut out three bits of the polypore here for my razor strop and I thought I'd actually attach it to the wooden sheath of my knife. I'm going to try and super glue them on at the end so there's always somewhere to hone it. I'll just rough up the sheath a little bit because I know it's got some leftover oil on it from when I waterproofed it. Okay, it's good. It's got a pretty solid bond on there. I think wood glue would work pretty well for this as well. It's going to neaten up this edge a tiny bit. There we have it, a built-in handy honing surface. The knife I've got here is already quite sharp, so I'm just going to use a very fine grit 800 whetstone here. So we're gonna just quickly do a few passes. This knife actually has a chisel bevel, so I only really need to sharpen one side. So the blade's actually really sharp now, but if you looked it under a microscope, there'd still be a lot of uh, microscopic roughness in the structure of the edge. So in order to take that out, we're gonna take our birch polypore honing surface, so I've got my three bits here glued onto my sheath and we're just going to run it backwards and forwards like that at about a 45 degree angle, a little flick at the end and we're going to polish that edge, take away any extra steel that may be sticking out rough and so this is the final process of knife sharpening which is called honing and it's kind of to make your blade a little bit more durable so that microscopic structure is a lot smoother and longer lasting. You can see actually the polypore turning slightly grey there, taking off some of that metal. Incredible. If you've ever been to a um, traditional barber's before who uses a cutthroat razor, you may have seen them doing this with the cutthroat razor. Wow, feels really sharp now. Let's try it on a piece of paper. Cut paper nicely and uh, that'll do for chopping onions anyway. Now one of the items, artifacts that was found with Utsi the Iceman was these kind of donuts attached to a leather cord. I think they were around his neck and as I said before they were they sort of uh, hypothesized that he was using them to treat his gastrointestinal upset from the whipworm parasite. So let's see if we can make a little replica. Cut a slice off. Maybe a couple. The pair of scissors, I'm going to try and attempt to cut a circle out of the polypore. There we go. There we have it, the Utsi Iceman Polypore Necklace Replica. Let's go and try it out. What do you reckon? Next big craze? Should start churning these out. There's one more property of this Swiss army knife mushroom that I want to try out, which is its ability to hold an ember. So I think what we should do is take a dried bit like this, which has been drying in the cupboard for about a year, 
I'm going to rough it up and try and make it quite fibrous and then we'll try and land a spark or take a flame to it and see if it can indeed hold an ember. So we're going to use the flesh of the polypore. I'm going to take a knife and just try and see if I can rough up the surface. You see it's becoming quite hairy there. I reckon these little tiny hairs can get a little pile of them, land a spark into it. I think that's what's going to do it. Take these little fibre that's, fibres that we've done, put them in a piece of leather. Obviously the mushroom is dried at this point, you want to, everything to be as dry as possible. Okay, I've got everything ready, a bit of leather with the birch polypore fibre in. Got a knife and a fire steel here, and a bit of pine just in case we can get an ember. Maybe we can get some fire out of it. Let's see. Oh my god. Come on. Okay, let's see if we can get this a bit bigger. Done it. We've done it. We've made fire. enjoyed this video about the birch polypore mushroom and all its amazing uses from tea and wound dressing all the way to fire making. If you want more content like this please consider subscribing to the channel and uh, we'll get some more mushroom and other crafty related videos made up shortly. Cheers!